Welcome back to another episode of the Verity View Pod, an, S- an Austin FC podcast brought to you by KP, the, a- the ADC in Austin, Texas. I'm Paul Limgood, Senior Digital Sports Producer. And joining me, we have uh, culture reporter uh, Brittany Flowers, sports anchor Jake Garcia, and Austin FC head coach Josh Wolf. Thanks for uh, joining us today. My pleasure. Woo! Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, Insert no problem. Applause. <laughs> we'll only take like about like an hour with you. So um, yeah. we'll make it real <laughs> I'm free. quick. <laughs> I'm free. I got nothing but time. I got nothing but time. There you go. Uh, so I guess we're just going to open it up with, you know, obviously you've had eight straight home game or eight straight away, away games, but now we're heading into this first home game. So t- just talk about the excitement of you and your players finally getting to play in front of the home fans. Yeah, I think um, it's a little bit of an unknown, but I think our guys have seen what the community um, vibe is. Certainly there's an energy there. There's there's certainly a real vibrance to the city. And mm-hmm. uh, this team is has a, to- a ton of support. And I think um, it's been difficult on the road, probably more difficult than, than we expected. But um, we were able to get some points. And, and when you play at home in this league, it's really, really important that you, that you capture as many points as you can because you have the fans behind you. Mm-hmm. Um, you're obviously in your own your own city, you're in your own space and you're in your own comfort zone. But having our fans and being at Q2 and, and the level of uh, energy that we know that, that our crowd's going to have and 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 just support that they've already given. And uh, I think yeah. it's extremely excited. The players are very excited and, and we look forward to getting on the field without a doubt Saturday night. It's going to be wild now happening before that. Obviously, we see the U.S. Women's National Team. What were your thoughts when you found out they would be playing even before you all yeah I think it's um yeah, I think it's great I think it's great that there's a there's an opportunity to see what the stadium looks like um and and the women are an amazing team that's the best that's the best team in the world so it's a great opportunity one for the game to be in our city um we we've got great support for the sport of soccer here men and women and um it, it's again it's a great opportunity for fans of soccer to see the highest level of women and um you know it's also now for us as Austin FC fans or an organization you get to see what the stadium looks like how you have a little bit of a trial run through there, but, but with a full house, I mean, I expect it to be packed. I expect it to be uh, vibrant. I expect it to be loud. So um, all those things will be a a way for us to be able to check it out as well. But um, having them here is great. I think again, someone that's played for the national team and I've, I've been around the women, the U S women's national team, whether it was the Olympics or just in passing um, um, they're, they're the best in the world and they're fantastic competitors. They're fantastic human beings. And, and again, I think it's a great opportunity for our community, but our players, our organization, everybody to see that up close would be great. Josh, the, the thing that I've learned about you uh, in, in covering your time with Austin FC for the past year plus now is that uh, you don't like to talk a lot about yourself. It's always kind of deflected about the guys and the team and, and what you're building. But I, I do want to ask you because um, you know, you're a first year head coach. You've just gone through eight straight road games. You've navigated a global pandemic and, and the challenges of putting a team together in that. Uh, yeah. What have you learned just in the past eight games, month and a half or so about yourself as a coach that you didn't know before you went through that? Um, about myself as a coach. Um, well, again, it's my first time going through it as a coach. And, and I think I've had, a you know, the last six or seven years as an assistant to be prepared, but um, when you are the head coach, it's 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 tough to fully, you know, for the first time, it's tough to fully grasp what's at stake and and how much you want to. Obviously, you need to delegate responsibilities throughout our organization. So being here from the start and building out our, you know, the foundation of who we were, hiring our, our high performance and Dave Tenney, hiring our scouting with Manuel Junco, our staff with our coaches here. That helps um, relieve some of the duties that that I have from day to day, but it also allows me to know that I have high level people around me. And, um, you know, that's the first thing is, is having good people that, that are committed the same way that I'm committed. Um, but, but the learning, I think from in game and certainly during the week of training, those things are, those things are also being shaped and, and, and when you need to push the gas, when you need to back off based on where the players are at and, and also what the eight games on the road during the, during COVID and what it was like for us, it, it was challenging. I haven't been in that space in, in the last two years in the league. So that was also a, a different navigation for me day of travel, re, re, you know, returning at 4 a.m., what that does to your team, not only for that those next couple of days, but for the preparation. So those were difficult things. And, and I think we learned from them and we navigate them. And, and me as a coach and our staff, I think we learned from that as well. And, uh, it doesn't make the next um, these home games any easier or the next eight games any easier, but it does give us a bit, you know, a little bit of a, a, an idea of what it's looked like. We're going to have a lot more games at home, which helps us but it's also going to be warmer and they're going to come quicker. So we, we got to be pretty buttoned up and, 
and again, continue to get better. We have to continue to progress and, and, and have good performances. To, pick, uh, to piggyback on that, I know, I mean, starting your season with eight row games is a challenge in and of itself, but like, yeah. um, just like with an expansion team, like what kind of unique, uh, unique challenges or even like what, what's been surprising to you uh, that you've learned about your team in the past month and a half? Um, for an expansion team, there's a, there's a lot of camaraderie and chemistry already. And I think, um, more so in our league, the, the, the off field, um, the ability to bring the guys together off field is really, really important in this, in this league. Uh, again, I, it's very different than, than Europe and South America in that way. There's, um, camaraderie, locker room, bonding, team chemistry plays a big role in, in MLS. And, uh, I, again, I think it has to do with our American culture and the way that we, we bring people in, we naturally bring pre people in. Um, but, but it's, it's been challenging the, the road's been very difficult. These guys came in in January and, and started putting work together. They, they got here as quick as possible to assimilate, to meet the community, to find places to live. And, and I think that helped bring us together in a quick way. And we also had th storms that wiped out the grid for like a week. And, and even in that, <laughs> you had people coming together, you know, having GoFundMe to help the community but also leaning on each other to help each other getting through that. It, it was really interesting to see how they leaned on each other and the support that they, they not only gave one another, but others in the community. So I think that the team bonding aspect is what I think we've really missed because of COVID. We're not able to do team events or have, you know, the families and kids, everybody together. So that's been a big miss, but um, I think that's changing. And that'll again, help build in not just the identity on the field, but, but the identity and the, the relationships off the field. I think they've been a huge part of the community, even with all of the challenges. I, I feel like I see them everywhere. They're a part of everything. It's been awesome to see. So how has the league changed? And I guess really just kind of the sport of soccer changed since you were a player. Uh, drastically. Uh, since I was a player. I mean, oof, that was that was like 10 years ago. It's, it's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> Um, it's changed in a lot of ways. The, 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 the amount of quality that's coming into the league, the ages as, as at which these players are coming 23, 24, 25 year olds that we're getting from South America and from Europe. Um, you know, our development of our own players, the youth now 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds that are able to develop within our, our Academy system and contribute to the first team. Um, again, the, 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 the on-field product has changed drastically. But the infrastructure, the stadiums, the, the training centers, I mean, it, it couldn't be further from uh, what, what it was like in my, my first five, 10 years in the league. You know, and, and again, I, I, I stopped playing and I forget what it was, 2012, 13, somewhere in there. But, um, you know, the growth since then has been tremendous. The on-field product, the coaching, um, the development, and then the visibility, the viability of the sport in this, in this, in this country has, has um, really started to rise. And, and again, I think it's a reflection of, of how we're developing um, our own talent and, and just what we're able to do globally. Now we, we, we are a recognized country that has talent playing in many, many big clubs in every country in the world now, or many countries I, in the world. When it comes to uh, Saturday's matchup against uh, San Jose, what, what are you seeing when you look at them on film and Austin FC wins this game? If what happens? Um, well, I, see, I think you see a very competitive, uh, a very competitive group. I mean, they, they are very much a man orientation. We, we've, you know, I've been able to watch them, obviously, um, being with the national team, we would keep tabs on players. So um, the way that they play makes, they make it difficult on you. There's a lot of dueling. They, they, they go man for man and it, it, it looks awkward from the outside, but it becomes very challenging to navigate. And um, you got to be careful that you don't disorganize yourself while trying to disorganize them. And that's, that's really important. Um, but it's going to be competitive. They, they compete and they duel. And, and we've got to understand the, the idea of how quickly we need to play, get access to certain areas. And, and, and again, try to punish some of their, their movements that they have as a group. And, and we'll win. Uh, Austin FC will win if, 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 again, I think we take our opportunities. Again, over the course of the first eight games, there's been good and bad. But we've left too many goals out there on the, on the, on the board. And uh, we got to be much more efficient at home. We're going to have the energy. We're going to have the tempo. Uh, we got to make sure we're fresh. And, um, you know, we're, we're playing at home for our first time. And, and we, 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 um, we need to put everything in that, that, that we can to give these fans what they deserve. And, and three points is what we're looking for. And we're going to push uh, extremely hard for it. And, hey, guys, really quick, uh, Coach is about five minutes away from going uh, to his local media availability for the week, which are a lot of hard-hitting questions. So let's, uh, let's set the stage for that and give him some softball questions from Brittany with Rapid Fire. Yes, are you ready? Ready. These are the hardest questions you will get all day. I guarantee it. All right, let's do it. Okay, question number one. 
What is better, South Carolina barbecue or Texas barbecue? Texas barbecue. All right. Okay. Do you have a game day ritual? No. No. Is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. What do you think people should get yellow and red cards for in real life? In real life? Um, I think for bad driving. Um, <laughs> is that a yellow or a red? Uh, it's a yellow. I think, uh, what else? What are things that drive me crazy? Um, sorry, the, the, the camera. Yellows and red cards in life. That's great. Um, just bad people. Just just rude people. I think that that more than anything. We're in such a we're in such a funny space these days with you know the culture, the cancel culture, all that, like just bad people, rude people, you know, disingenuous people. I, I think red cards they they should be, and that you see enough around society now that there's just been too much. There's been too much shift to just the negative aspects and. Yeah, rude, bad people should just be punted for life. <laughs> just, just, just be kind. Just be nice. Yeah. Just have some have some sense of moral aptitude here. That's awesome. Cool. Okay, what is the best costume you have ever worn for Halloween? Um, for Halloween, oh, those are terrible ones. Uh, <laughs> I, I did I, what I what I wear one time. Um, oh my God, what's our Sam? Sam? How can I forget Sam? Like the the big bearded guy. Oh my God. Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam. There you go. How can I forget oh, okay. that? <laughs> one of my, one of my banner. Nephew. Ones. Yeah. Uncle, Uncle Sam. Go ahead. Uh, when there are bugs in your house, do you kill them or do you let them out? It's, it's funny you asked that. We had a wasp in there the other day. I did everything I could to cup it and let it out, do the nice safe relief, but he got wild and, and, and escaped the cup and he, he, oh. he had a slow death. <laughs> a slow death. <laughs> I caught him again and killed him. It wasn't uh, great. Oh, R.I.P. R.I.P. Uh, what is your go-to karaoke song? Um, go-to karaoke song. It would be anything U2. I mean, I'm a U2 sicko, so just about anything U2. Not that I can carry a tune, but it's it's all I've grown up on. They're the only so you loved it when they sneaky dropped all their whole album on your phone? Any any album that they've ever had, I, I'm, I'm sure I've seen. My brother was an avid bootleg guy. There was so much U2 in my life growing up. He, he, anything he, had, and everything the, he had the YouTube album on his phone. And then Apple forced it on his phone. And so he had it twice. <laughs> yeah, probably true. Um, who is the funniest on the team? The funniest on the team? Interesting. I'm her coach. coach. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it, it, from the outside looking in, I mean, Cecilia has a lot of personality. John Gallagher, I've seen him on whatever this is. He's social media stuff. He seems to have a little bit of personality as well. But um, <laughs> the funny, just pure humor. I'm, I'm not sure. It's a good question. We're not around the guys as much. That's Every you know. other person has said Rodney. Rodney Rodney's yeah mm -hmm. he's well he's also getting fined left right and center so they they're probably <laughs> they probably laugh with him and at him quite a bit <laughs> okay uh what's something you never travel without um uh never travel I mean never travel without toiletry bag I mean I, I don't know like just I'm not I wouldn't say I print too much but some cologne toothpaste and some some hair product <laughs> that's about it that's pretty good. Look, okay, la apart. last question, because I know you have to go. In your best yeah. Matthew McConaughey impression, will you say, all right, all right, all right? All right, all right, all right. Wait, and then before <laughs> before we let him go, Brittany, you have to shit, like, I, you have to I've shown you go down before, memory lane. But here's. Yeah, she showed me this when I first got here. That's yeah. It. Picture in that's Albuquerque, it. right? That's correct. Very good. I yeah. I remember. I so you were coaching me before you coached these guys. That's it. That's it. I was, that was, that was my first taste of what it was like to be a coach. And now here we are. Here, here we, we are. are. Full so circle. you're welcome. Full circle. <laughs> there you go. Thank we you, appreciate you, thank we, you. we appreciate you coach. Thanks for coming on. Awesome. Thanks for having me guys. All right, guys, we have a, uh, a very historic week of sports here in Austin. Um, so, I mean, just to quickly recap, uh, Austin just tied, um, with Sporting KC 1-1. Uh, we can talk about that match in a second, but coming up this week, um, the women's national team is coming to Q2 to play the very first game in Q2 stadium. And then this, uh, this Saturday is the first Austin FC home game against San Jose. So I'm going to toss it over to our, um, huge, uh, fan of, of all things soccer and women's national team. She cried in California when she got to see the team play Brittany, um, how excited are you that they're coming this week? Oh, man. I was saying that this is like the best week of my life because it's all soccer. Every day is soccer. Uh, 
Yeah, it's amazing. They're the best team in the world. Having the best team in the world be the team that christens the stadium is uh, it's got to be at least a little bit of an honor. Of course, you always want to be the home team that gets to break in your field. But I mean, if it's not going to be you it might as well be the greatest, most dominant team in the world. But yes, of course, I'm so excited. I don't know if tears will be flowing. I never know until all of a sudden it happens and I'm just crying. <laughs> uh, they might be. Uh, yeah. California. It was at the Rose Bowl. It was a surprise. We walked out and I immediately started crying when I saw the players. So uh, I'm going to try and play it a little bit cooler this time around. So we're recording this on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Um, Obviously, before the game on Wednesday, before we have uh, our weekly media availability with Josh Wolf and the players, but something that I'm just really uh, curious to see what they have to say. And I think it's going to be nothing but support, but I I just wanted to confirm this. Just what does Austin FC think about uh, them not being the ones to play the first match ever? It's their stadium. Uh, it's not even like a situation at, at UT where you have the Moody center, which is kind of billed as like, this is an arena for the city. It's an arena for music and events. Oh, and the UT men's and women's basketball teams also happen to play there. That's not really the situation for Q2. Like this was, this was a privately financed stadium for them. Uh, with that being said, I think they are, they're going to be nothing but overjoyed and happy and supportive that. The U.S. women's national team is coming. It's the first time a national team in any sport has ever come to Austin. Uh, and I, I think it's it's going to be an amazing atmosphere. I think if you ask them, even if they were feeling a little bit like, oh, man, I wish it was us. I don't think they would say it. But well, except Sebastian kind of did he, he, he last did. week. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he, it was like in a joking manner. But like, he, yeah. you know, yeah. but he did, he was like, yeah, like, I wish it could have been us, you know. Um, and I think that's understandable too. Like I, if I were them, I'd be a little bit bummed that I'm not the first team playing there with that being said, like a lot of the guys are going to the game on Wednesday. Uh, Stuver told us he was going, we know, uh, Aaron Schoenfield's going to watch his wife, Abby Dahlkemper play. Um, so I, I, I mean, I think there is nothing but goodwill and positivity because they know that like the Austin FC fight for soccer is uh, their cause is only aided by people watching how good the U.S. women's national team is. And those Uh, tickets, I mean, we found out about a a little bit ago, there's less than 500 tickets left. mm -hmm. As of this moment, like we said, we're recording on a Tuesday, the day before. And I'm sure those those 500 tickets are are very expensive, which Mm -hmm. (laughs) could show you that the demand that there are for them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You guys went to the the practice, how, how did that all go? What was, what was that like? I think they like immediately, what I saw was a lot of people kind of like bouncing on the field, getting a feel for it to kind of see how it feels. Cause it, I mean, fields are different from place to place. Um, we saw, so the guy who does the field at Q2, his name is Weston Applefeller, I think. What a cool name first off. But uh, it's like his baby. If you so when we first got out there, he was out there on the field, I think, looking at things this last Saturday while the like watch party at Q2 was happening. He was out there on the field and I wrote him on Twitter and I said, are you ready for it to be used? And I can't, he said something like, I think so, because it's his <laughs> baby. It's going to get stomped all over. But yeah, that's what I saw. I saw them all just kind of like getting a feel for the field but it's gorgeous. Like it's beautiful. The U S women's national team has been like tweeting and posting on Twitter, just how beautiful the stadium is. Katerina Macario was one of the players that was like, Oh yeah, this is gorgeous. So how could, I mean, it it is, it is a beautiful stadium. Yeah. It's state of the art. Um, I saw Megan Rapino come, come out of the locker room tunnel and just kind of take it all in, look around. Um, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful stadium. And, uh, even, even for top of the world players, like they, they know it's a fantastic stadium too. Um, and I think, I think a lot of the players on the U S women's national team know and have heard just about how embraceive Austin has been, 
uh, of women's soccer. I think they remember back from the World Cup in 2019 that Austin was the top media market in the U.S. in terms of people watching the Women's World Cup. So they didn't forget about that. They know that there's excitement for Austin FC, and I think they're, they're very much looking forward to playing in front of this Austin crowd. I just posted on Instagram just a video of Carly Lloyd juggling on the field. It's in front of the supporter section, You like the ATX. <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's a wild thought like they're here they're in Austin first time ever it's pretty it's amazing like this is this is history right here it's pretty cool yeah so I mean they just got done playing in Houston uh, I want to say they played against Portugal correct I think this was or, uh, so they right? just played against Jamaica Jamaica on Sunday gotcha Portugal yeah. was on Thursday yeah, whatever so the 10th that, that was, was yeah, yeah okay um, but anyway so they they just played in Houston and you Brittany said you went to a watch party to watch that game. What was that like? No, so I went to a watch party for Q2. The Q2. At That's Q2. What was. That was watching Austin FC on Saturday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. The U.S. women's national team I watched from my couch, mostly standing. Mostly standing. <laughs> and cheering. Stand, uh, standing, standing on your couch? No, I would not stand on my couch. I'm an adult. Um, I might stand on my couch. Uh, no, but the... Do you want me to talk about the watch party at Q2? Yeah, how was so that? They opened it up, I'm assuming, so that they could, you know, figure out logistics, parking, and everything. What we did was we parked at one of the uh, garages that's at the domain, and then you take a shuttle down. So that's something you have to pay for. I think mm-hmm. it was like 25 bucks, something like that. You go, you park, you get a wristband, you take a shuttle. It was actually a really smooth process. Um, the mood was really cool. I think everybody was just really excited to be there, um, Mm -hmm. to check it all out. There were uh, a lot of people like having drinks and stuff. The food is obviously pretty uh, expensive, but here's a little Mm -hmm. hint. We got a kid's meal hot dog that had like, you get a hot dog chips and a small kid's drink. And it was pretty affordable. It was like less than six bucks. But then we also got a $15 margarita that was really good. And people kept asking us where we got it from. Um, but the mood in the stadium was really cool. It was nice because, you know, there's certain seats that will be in the sun at that like 2 p.m. kickoff time, which yeah. isn't going to be fun. But most of the seats were shaded. It was already loud in there. So I can only imagine how amazing it's going to be this coming Saturday. It's going to be awesome. What, As for what? the U.S. Women's National Team yeah. on Sunday, that game was exciting. They started a lot of people that we don't normally see starting. And that's probably because they want to get their minutes in. They want to see, they want to test them out because they haven't made their Olympic lineup yet. They haven't revealed the 18 players that will be going to the Olympics. So they tested out some players. We saw a lot more goals than we saw uh, in the previous game. So that was exciting to see. You always want to see goals scored. So hopefully tomorrow's game Wednesday's game is going to be a lot of goals scored as well. It should be a good one. Hey, Brittany. Uh, so, so here's a question for you because um, as you mentioned, they're still trying to get down to that 18 uh, magic number for their roster. Would you expect uh, the game against Nigeria to feature like a lot of those players that are on the bubble and maybe we don't get to see as much of the Rapinos and the Morgans and the, uh, the big stars that we already know will be on the Olympic team. So that's what I was wondering. So their, their first game of this summer series, they did have the stars coming out to start their second game, which was on Sunday. They had those bubble players that you're like, Ooh, this is probably like 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 for that 18 people roster. Mm Mm-hmm. So this is the third game. So I don't know if it's going to be a mixture of those stars. Part of me is maybe hoping, but I mean, it's brand new stadium. Maybe they want their stars to be out there. They're putting their best foot forward here in Q2 just because of it's it, because it's a special event. But yeah, I mean, we've seen both. So we've seen the stars play. We've seen the kind of bubble players play. So now maybe it's going to be a mixture this time around for their third game of the summer series. Yeah, it might be so. like a... It might be like an NFL preseason type situation where you roll out the A team for a few series and then you're like, all right, don't want to have any of you guys injured for when it actually matters. Um, But like at the same time, 
the games that do matter are fast approaching. And while the U S might be the favorite to win the, the Olympics this year, uh, the overwhelming favorite, I think like those players are going to want to make sure that, you know, their game is as fine tuned and as firing on all cylinders as possible. So I bet if Rapino is like, Hey, I just need to, to feel a ball touching my feet a little bit more. She she'll stay out there as, as long as she's needed to feel comfortable, I guess. Right. Yeah. I mean, you want to get, since this is the last game of the summer series, they still have the send off series before the Olympics, but last game of summer series, they might want to get some of those players that they are pretty dang sure are going to be going to the Olympics, at least playing some more time together, just kind of a, as a reminder for how each other play. And, you know, many of them have probably been playing years together, but it's always nice to get just a little bit more time because Vlotko coach Vlotko says, you know, he very much focuses on sort of the little details of the game. And this is one way to do it is by getting those good players in and really focusing on those little details within that before they go to the Olympics. But I'm hoping, man, I'm really hoping one of the players that she, so Rose Lavelle twisted her ankle on Sunday in training today. I don't know if you noticed, she like had this like boot type thing on her ankle. I don't know if you saw that Jake, but I, I don't I know what, it, I don't no. know what it was, but she was not like in the mix moving around with them. One player that we did see in the mix running around people, but we will not see for sure is Tobin Heath. She's just a like training player. So she's not officially going to be playing, but you know, I think she'll be probably ready for the send off series since she is training with them. Julia is also I not here because she hurt her knee, but what I heard is that she'll be fine for, I think the send off series. And then one more thing too, I know we've kind of been bouncing back and forth between the U S women's national team and Austin FC. But I mean, I really think like it's all related in a sense. And, and part of your point, Brittany, about uh, the, the watch party on Saturday of like, just like the stadium ops people kind of figuring out the flow of dealing with fans and stuff. Part of me wonders too, if the reason for scheduling the U S women's national team, aside from the fact that like they're a, they're a big name is to just be like, okay, like this is what it's going to look like on game day. This is kind of another dress rehearsal type situation. Yeah. And if things go, things go poorly, you can either say, Hey, that's not our fault. Like the U S women's national team was in charge <laughs> of all of this, but also you're like taking <laughs> mental notes too of, you know, things that need to be addressed come Saturday Two practice runs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would uh, almost argue that it might be, more like I feel like there might there might be a higher sense of um interest in the women's national team than there would be with with the MLS team just because of I don't know if that's true or not but I mean like it, maybe like start off with a really uh high um ticketed game and just get that out of the way so then it's like when you have those regular home games you're like okay well we've already had a crazy, you know, women's national team game where we got practice in uh, ter in terms of the stadium ops and everything. Um, I don't know. That's that was just something that. Yeah, I, get, I could go either way on that because, like, while the U.S. women's national team like has all the accolades, it there's not that like personal local feeling that sure. pe people get with Austin FC. So the way I'm envisioning it in my head. I think a lot of people are going to show up and we know that tickets are almost sold out for the women's national team. I just don't envision as rowdy and as, you know, electric of a crowd as I do for Saturday. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Saturday. Uh, so they're uh, coming up uh, on that first home game against San Jose, the earthquakes, and they are uh, currently slated as a playoff team in the West with nine points. Um, Austin FC has eight points and are just, just under that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the first home game is right around the corner. Um, Josh Wolf and all the players have, um, said how much, how excited they are to, um, finally have this eight game stretch over with, um, and finally get to play, um, their, their first slew of home games. And I feel like that's going to be a huge, I feel like to this point, you know, eight points in eight games against, I was looking at, I told you guys uh, on Twitter that the teams they played are uh, very good teams. So not even just road games, but um, 
five of the uh, five of the eight are against the top four teams in the MLS West. The uh, a sixth game of the eight is a Eastern Conference playoff team. So six currently slated playoff teams and road games, and they have eight points. Like that's not can't ask for much more than that in my mind. Did yeah, it feel about, like it went fast for you guys? One hundred percent. Yeah, so fast. How fast. Yeah. Um, I would I would say Austin FC is about where I thought they would be. I mean, maybe they didn't take the exact path that I thought they would take to get there because, I mean, there was a point where we were like thirty three and zero, or however thirty six and zero, thirty seven and zero, yeah. Um, or 36 and one after that first loss. But like, I mean, this is, this should be about where we expected them to be first year coach, a team that hasn't played together, a team that was put together in a pandemic, a bunch of new guys to the league, a ton of road games to start off. I think uh, eight points in eight games is pretty, pretty acceptable. I think it makes that, this Saturday, the first home game, so much more special for both fans and players. I think it's going to be electric. It's going to be loud. Like you said, you use the word rowdy. I think it's going to be rowdy. I think it'll be just so awesome. I think it'll be things that, you know, kids who go with their parents will be like, oh my gosh, remember that one time when we got to see Mm -hmm. the very first home game? I think that's what it'll be on Saturday. Something that people remember forever. I think it's like, it's a beautiful relationship because uh, the players need the fans right now. And, and I mean, the fans obviously need the players, um, but like, it's, it's awesome to, just to see like that dynamic and the, the relationship that's been built there. And like the build up to this game has, has been like crazy. Like you can feel um, just the excitement and the passion. It's like, all right, finally, we get to play at our home stadium in front of our home fans. And, you know, we're obviously coming at the end of the global pandemic. So some of these people went Mm, a long time without any fans. I talked to uh, Crystal Dunn about it and she was saying, oh my gosh, like, yes, we appreciated fans before, but now like, playing we can't imagine playing without fans again she said it makes such a it really actually makes a difference having the fans there um and that the appreciation is just far beyond fans are a big part of sports you know and especially like you're gonna have la murga de austin just doing the chants and screaming the whole time (laughs) which you can learn we'll put them up on kview.com so everybody (laughs) can know all the chants there you go uh it's it's interesting i don't want to get like from a looking from a 10,000 foot view, um, like we obviously started the season, okay, there's eight straight road games. I'll be curious to see where the team stands because they're about to do five, uh, five home games out of the next six. So after that stretch, I'm curious to see where they sit after that because it's like, okay, you got eight points through eight road games. Where do you stand after you play at home all these different times? And it's a lot of teams that they're, that they're, um, that they've already played. So, I mean, uh, obviously this first uh, home game is against San Jose, who they haven't played yet, but then they play against Minnesota on the road, but then they play, um, uh, they play LAFC during this, this road or this home stretch. They play uh, Seattle during this home stretch. And then obviously um, Columbus crew will be a, a huge, a huge uh, home game. Uh, Sebastian said that, that he sees that being a huge rivalry game. So, I mean, we're playing a handful of teams at home that we've already played on the road. So, I mean, it'll be an interesting uh, dynamic to see after this stretch. And in my mind, just looking at it from that standpoint. Yeah, they've gotten through the hardest part of their schedule. uh, And now, I mean, the rest of the season is an overwhelming amount of home games. Uh, They don't have to leave the state of Texas that much at all. I want to say, like, they, they leave the state once uh, between now and like the start or middle of August. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think it's, I think it's to Minnesota, like you mentioned. Um, mm-hmm. So, so yeah, they're, they've gotten through the, the gauntlet of their schedule. And uh, now let's see what happens when, when they have the support. Really quickly. I want to shout out um, Jake's story that he had last night. Um that was if you haven't watched it yet, it's really really fun. But actually, both the the stories leading up to the women's national team game have been really good. The, uh, the one you did last night with 
um, Abby and uh, and Aaron about their um, their marriage and everything. They have he hasn't seen her play since they've gotten married, so that'll be a, a, a fun first. And then also the local coach at Southwestern who played um, on the women's national team back in in the nineties. Uh, but yeah, everyone should go check those two stories out. Yeah, so I mean, we kind of talked about uh, Linda Hamilton and her connection to the first ever women's World Cup team in our last podcast. Um, again, like she's a trailblazer. Her, her contributions to the, the teams of the past were incredibly important. But like the point I was trying to make in the story is what she's done for the current generation of players and what that past generation of players, all of them have done. It like we wouldn't be to the point we are today without their sacrifices. And like they were sacrifices because a lot of them had to choose playing soccer for the women's national team over starting a family, having a job that like actually paid you a livable wage. Um, so like that, what they did and I, we're not in a perfect place uh, as the, the fight for equal pay is, is very much uh, still real, but like what they did allows us to be now in a place where like, we can sit here and say we are excited to watch the U.S. women's national team play because there's less in, than 500 tickets left. Yeah, because back in 1991, um, like I don't think I don't know if anyone would have even known about it. So I'm happy where where we're at today in terms of Dahl Kemper and Schoenfeld. Yeah, I mean, like they're that's that's my point that I'm making in that like. Austin FC is connected to the U.S. women's national team in a whole bunch of different ways. And that's just another example of that. And Schoenfeld hasn't gotten to play because he's been hurt. Um, but, you know, like this is still his team, still his city. And to get to see his wife play, who's been playing in uh, Europe uh, with Manchester City, like I, I didn't like make this the title of the story, but I kind of wanted to. It's a... Uh, what, what was I going to say? It's their, <laughs> it's their first reunion since their union. Oh, yeah. So I like it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Awesome. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm, we're, everything's all set up for this week. Um, you know, we got the both, both games coming in um, women's coming in on Wednesday and the men starting their, their home debut on Saturday, um, but we'll kind of wrap wrap that up uh, for this time around. Um, we're going to uh, you can get all your uh, your Austin FC you know content on kvu.com slash Austin FC, or you can text 512-459-9442, Text word soccer. You can get all those links, or as we've always said, you can text Brittany and she'll reply with yes. Um, <laughs> text me at five 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 zero one two three. Text me soccer and I will say yes, please. Thank I, you. I I don't know if anyone has actually taken advantage of that yet, but um, I love that. I love that joke. <laughs> Thank you. Gets me every time. <laughs> you know what's funny is that people actually text me all the time about playing soccer. Like yesterday, it works. You need me to play on your team, I'll do it. There you go. Works all for right. Me. Sounds good. And uh, we also appreciate um, Josh Wolf for coming on. So uh, well, we appreciate Coach for talking with us. So uh, yeah, we will catch you guys next time. Um, I'm never nervous to talk to the players. He's like, you're nervous. You're like, you're nervous to talk to coach. A coach? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be, sound like a dummy. I'm okay <laughs> sounding like a dummy in front of the players. <laughs> no, there's no dummies. Oh! There's no dummies. There's no dummies. Oh man. Liam, Paul, you got to leave that part in. <laughs> yeah. That's going in the bloopers, man. <laughs> oh my God. Hi coach. Hello, how are you guys? Doing fantastic. <laughs>